Gentleman Noel Lilly is an L.A. County firefighter who was an Army Ranger who had multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And if there's anybody who has seen some stuff, it's Noel. And not only did he have those traumas to unpack, but he had some really personal traumas. And they really led to his life going to a very dark place. And I'm going to talk about that with you. And we're going to talk about that with Noel. We're going to get into it. He's going to talk about his journey to healing. And maybe it'll help all of us find healing as well, right here on the Manlyhood Mancast. Are you ready to live life to the full? Are you ready to rise up and live a life of honor? Are you ready to boldly step into a life of courage? This is the Manlyhood Mancast. And here's your host, Josh Atcher. Gentlemen, welcome to the Manlyhood Mancast. I'm your host and the founder of this Manlyhood movement, Josh Hatcher, and I am so glad that you guys are tuning into this episode today. I am so excited to be able to talk to Noel Lilly from his podcast, The Fire You Carry, and we're going to talk about his experience uh, in the Army as an Army Ranger, is his experience as an L.A. County firefighter, and his experience of loss and grief and trauma and how he overcame those things to be able to be a better husband and father and leader. These are the things that we all need to do. These are the things we all need to grow in. And I really feel confident that Noel's got some really good insights for us. So before we get into that, please, I want you to support what we're doing. If you appreciate what you're hearing today, please share this episode with a friend. Share it on your Facebook wall, share it on Instagram, put it out there on all the socials, put it on Twitter. Let the people know that you're appreciating what you're hearing here at Manlyhood because it matters, right? Masculinity, manhood, fatherhood, being a good husband, these things matter. And we need to tell people that it matters. We need to represent and to not be ashamed of it. So let's do this together. Give this episode a share wherever it is that you're listening to it. Let's put it out there so that people can see what we're doing. All of that being said, guys, we're going to get right into this episode with Noel Lilly right now. Noel, it's great to have you on the show. We've been kind of connecting for a little while online, and I am really excited about having this conversation with you for the guys that are listening today. Uh, so you're out in sunny California, right? I am, and thank you for having me, man. It's uh, It has taken a little bit too long to get this scheduled with both our schedules, but I'm I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. No problem. It's an honor, my friend. So uh, sunny California, what's it like out there? Is it really sunny or is it? Today, I live in the mountains near a place called Lake Arrowhead. So we are Southern California, but we're actually about at my house, we're almost 5,000 feet up. So we're in the pines. It usually is sunny, but today we're actually having thunderstorms in the area. So we have a little bit of cloud cover, which is really rare and kind of nice. It's been pretty hot this summer. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine. The mountains are probably better than uh, the lakes anyway, I think, or the than the ocean. I mean, the ocean's pretty, but... The know, ocean the- is very nice. And I mean, that's what people think of when they think of California. But when you are a fireman with just my income, my wife gets to stay home and homeschool our kids, which is a huge blessing and we love. I can't live by the beach. I can't afford it. So <laughs> we're here in the mountains. Hey, mountains are great anyway. You yeah, know, we love it. That's, that's the fun stuff. So, yeah. so tell me, uh, tell me about your story. I mean, I've, I've read a little bit and listened to some of the, the work that you're doing with the fire you carry. And, uh, I I'm really intrigued by it. And I think our listeners would like to know a little bit more about yourself as well. So sure. you tell us. Yeah. I have a little bit of an abnormal story. I grew up at a Christian camp. It's called Hume Lake and it's in the mountains North of here. So near Fresno central Valley area in the Sierra Nevada mountains. If you happen to know where the Sequoia National Monument is, where all the really big redwood trees are, the camp is actually kind of inside of that park on some private property. 
And I grew up there. My parents worked there. So I was there my whole life from when I was born until I graduated high school and went off into the army. So as part of that, I had a really different childhood. I was homeschooled all the way through high school. Um, never stepped foot in a regular school. My mom taught me all the way till I graduated. I started working for the camp during the summers at age 11. So I started doing manual labor really young, you know, raking needles, splitting wood, clearing forests, that type of stuff. Started running chainsaws at 14, driving tractors at 16, just kind of that type of work. And at an early age doing that, I decided that I wanted to go into the army specifically to be an army ranger. And I got that bug because I watched a documentary that my grandma had recorded on a VHS tape and sent home for us because we didn't have TV. So anything we watched was going to be on a VHS tape. So I watched that hundreds of times and decided that's what I was going to do as a documentary on actually ranger school, not on the ranger battalion, but I didn't know the difference. And I just wanted to do those things I saw in the video. So when I graduated high school, I, uh, I signed up and went off to Georgia, started doing that stuff, made it through the training to get into Ranger Battalion, ended up getting assigned to 1st Ranger Battalion, which is in Savannah, Georgia, so on the coast. In the middle of that training, I married my wife, Heather. We got engaged during a, uh, a break where I was getting, or I was actually graduating basic training. She came out to see me. I asked her to marry me. She said yes. And then when I had a break between my training and going to the unit, we got married. So she joined me out there. We left all of our family behind, went to Georgia where we knew nobody and started that journey. Um, I ended up deploying three times. I went to Iraq twice and Afghanistan once. Got to be a part of a lot of really cool stuff. I absolutely loved the job and the guys that I was working with. It was great. But Heather and I got pregnant um, right before my first deployment to Iraq. We ended up having twins. And it was becoming rapidly apparent that if I wanted to keep my wife and my family intact, I couldn't stay in the Ranger Battalion. The pace of the deployments and the training that we would do between deployments was just too much. I was almost never home. And especially for her being so young. I mean, I was 19. She was 18. We moved out there the uh, support structure just wasn't there. And she was a trooper. She was doing, she was doing as good as could be expected with it, but I just knew long-term it wasn't going to work out. So we made the decision to, to get out of the military and go back home. And right about that time when I was getting close to getting out, we lost our firstborn son. So we had twins. We had Asher and Avery. Avery is my daughter. She's 16. She's still with us. But her brother, Asher, uh, just passed away in the middle of the night. He was seven months old. And um, I won't go too deep into what happened that night. But essentially, my wife woke me up and said, Asher's not breathing and pulled him out, tried to do CPR on him. The medics came, took him away, and, and he didn't make it. So that happened about three months before I was scheduled to get out of the military. And because of the trauma of that, the the guys in my unit were wise enough and kind enough to say, Hey, you're done now. You're not going to reenlist. So they got me out a few months early and we came back home and just started kind of working jobs that would provide some food on the table. Nothing crazy, some construction work. I did like three jobs for, for a while, just trying to survive. And we, during that time, we obviously had a faith. We believed in God. I mean, I grew up in a Christian camp, right? So I, I knew I knew the, I knew the right answers and I did believe, but in that, during that time of our life, we weren't really living it very much. And after we lost Asher, we kind of just pulled into ourselves and kind of shut down. Essentially, we didn't really deal with it. We didn't have a ceremony for him because it was just too hard for us to process putting it together. We tried and we just stopped. We just said, this is too much. We can't do it. And just didn't really talk about it too much. And things just started to kind of get progressively worse as we weren't dealing with it. I had never been a drinker prior to that, but we both started drinking during that time. And then that rapidly became a problem because we were, we were using that as a coping mechanism, which, you know, as you know, is the, one of the worst things you can do, right? It just makes everything worse. So that's kind of what was happening. And I wasn't happy in my work was really unsatisfied with where my life was. And I was talking to my dad, who is a great godly man that uh, I just have a ton of respect for. He was still working at the camp at the time. And I was just asking him, what do you think I should do? I miss, 
I really missed at the time feeling like I was doing something with a purpose. Well, like when I was in Ranger Battalion, I felt like I had a, a mission and I really missed the camaraderie of the unit. And he said, well, I know some firemen that seem to be home a lot and they seem to enjoy their jobs and they seem to be happy. You should go talk to one of these guys. So I did. I went and talked to one of his buddies that was a fireman and he sold me on it within the first five minutes. I had never considered being a fireman before I talked to him, but he told me about it, what it was like, and I was in. So I started taking the tests and, and doing the things to become a fireman. And I got picked up relatively quick for our industry. Some guys work, literally, I know guys that have worked 10 to 12 years to get a job on the fire department. And it took me about a year. And really that was because I had the, the veterans experience. So you get extra points in all your stuff when you're a veteran, which is nice. So that kind of bumped me to the head of some lines. So I got picked up with Los Angeles County Fire and we moved down to Southern California, which was a move that I did not want to make. I didn't have fond feelings about Southern California being a, a Christian that grew up in a very conservative town. I was, you know, I was like, what is Southern California? That sounds terrible. The only thing I knew about Southern California was that Disneyland was fun from being going there <laughs> as a kid. But of course, you know, it's a lot bigger place than just that. And Disneyland is Disneyland and it's an island. So anyway, <laughs> We ended up down there and started going through the tower, which is the training to get in the battalion, um, get into the fire department. And life was still kind of spiraling out of control because while I had made it, you know, I was getting hired by this large department that was going to pay me enough that I could provide for my family. I was going to have medical benefits, all that worldly stuff that's important. We weren't taking care of the spiritual side of things, and we were still dealing with the loss of Asher and not really dealing with it, just kind of shoving it away. So things continued to kind of just, they were getting better in the worldly sense of like, I was finally making enough money to pr provide and we had a stable job finally, because I obviously made it to the tower and got out of the stations, but personal life was still not doing well. And eventually things just kind of came to a head where some things happened. I actually had a car repossessed because I was just not paying bills because I was being that irresponsible. I was just kind of putting stuff off because I wanted to do other things with the money. And right around that time, you know, I know, I know a lot of your listeners will identify with this, but when something goes wrong in life, it's never just one thing. There's always a bunch of stuff that happens at the same time. So we had a bunch of things go wrong and I felt like I was about to lose my wife. Like we were going to split, like that there was going to just be the end of the family. And I, I wasn't willing to have that happen. So I just kind of went back to the only thing that I knew and I just started going to church. I didn't, we didn't have a regular church at the time. And I just started going to church. And at the time, because of what was going on with my wife and I, I was just going solo. And there were Sundays where I would go to three services at three different churches, just because I was seeking something. I knew I needed help and I just was lost, made a decision that I was going to stop drinking entirely and just quit because I knew that it was becoming a problem. I wasn't being a dad when I was home. I wasn't able to be the husband I wanted to be for Heather. I was just relying on that as a crutch. So I, I quit that at that time, just completely. I haven't had a drop of alcohol since and just started praying. And eventually, shortly after that, started getting some actual marriage counseling with my wife, with a guy. Um, we've actually had him on our podcast and I will recommend that episode. His name is Max and he's a really great dude. We still go see him. We actually went and saw him last week. So he's a great episode. My, my little buddy, Indy just walked down. Hey buddy. Yeah. Talk to your mom. He's six. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. He's a good kid. What's up buddy? <laughs> he wanted to know if he could eat an otter pop. I told him, yes, I, I probably should have <laughs> told him no. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So Things after that point started really improving. We started leaning back into our relationships with God, started making those our own again. Heather also stopped drinking. And we just really started to grow back in the Lord and starting to rebuild our marriage and starting to really deal with that baggage that we had from, from losing Asher and then just, you know, from not walking with the Lord and not relying on him all those years. So things were really starting to improve and get better. And I was, I was, I would say happy in my work. But there were also other things that were happening at that time where I would go on calls where I would have an infant handed to me on scene that was in that was in full arrest. And now I have to I have to treat that baby because I'm it's me and my buddy on scene. 
And that happened to me pretty early on in my career. Like that literal thing happened, mm. which is hard, of course, for anybody. Those are the calls that haunt all firemen, paramedics, EMTs, police officers, you know, but for me, it was obviously then re reigniting all those old memories and making that tough. So on that level, I was still continuing to struggle with what I now know is, was post-traumatic stress related to that incident. And then I was, I was piling more on top of that. So was still kind of struggling with that. And then I missed a really big part of our story. When we first got back from the military, we got pregnant again and we had um, our son North who's now 15. So that happened really at rapidly after we lost Asher and he's, he's a great kid. Avery's great. They're both healthy, happy teenagers. Well, I mean, they're teenagers. So yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> they're great though. They're good kids. So anyway, flashback forward, we suddenly get pregnant again and it's a surprise and we're very afraid and also very excited. And we're going through the early ultrasounds and all that stuff. And we find out that lo and behold is twins again, which just wrecked our world and made it crazy exciting because one of the things we were initially concerned about was, well, our other kids are so old that is it, how's this baby going to fit in? He's going to feel alone. Well now, oh, he's got a built-in brother. So we were simultaneously excited but also terrified because we had lost a previous twin. And obviously that was still a fear for us, but we, we were praying about it and feeling good about it. And Heather goes in for a regular checkup and they tell her she leaves. And then they call her back and say, Hey, you need to come back now. There's a problem. So she ends up in the hospital and there's issues with the babies inside. And one of them has passed away. Mm. And they can't, it was a weird thing because I'd never thought about anything like that before because why would you? But my initial thought was, well, what are they going to do? And they can't do anything. So my wife has to carry both babies still, right? They can't go in and, and take the one out. They just have to wait. So she's carrying these twins, but she knows that one of them has already passed. And so there's now a new a risk that the other will also pass because there's impacts going on and all that stuff. So she gets hospitalized and we're in there for a few weeks. And then things start to go south with Indy, the little guy that just walked down the stairs. Spoiler alert. He's, <laughs> he's here. Uh, he ends up having to be born early and he was born way premature. He was born two pounds, eight ounces was what he was, what he weighed when he was born. And we ended up being in the NICU with him for just over two months and for the first big chunk of that time, it was literally every day was him fighting for his life. They just, they didn't know if he would make it because he was so small. And so of course he had all kinds of health issues during that time and was being fed through tubes and his nose and just, you know, really traumatic stuff and very hard to deal with. The neat thing that happened at that time though, is as a fireman, I had started to feel like I, I didn't really see the camaraderie that I came looking for. It wasn't the same as Ranger Battalion and nothing can be. I understand that. But I just kind of was feeling like, yeah, it's just another job. But the guys came out of the woodwork for me during that time. And when they found out what was happening, guys just started working my days for me. So we have this system where we can trade days. So like if you work for my department and you needed a day off, I could work for you essentially for free. And then you would repay me by working for me another day for free. So we just kind of swap days. So guys started doing that for me so that I could be with my family, with my wife and the NICU. But these are guys that were captains and engineers and I'm just a fireman. So there's no way I can actually ever work for them. I'm just not allowed to. So I can't repay them. And then the guys that were of my own rank were doing it to a man out of the goodness of their own heart. And nobody, nobody would allow me to repay them. So I basically just had a bunch of free time off so that I could be with my family during that time, which was just amazing. And then guys were coming to the hospital and bringing us food and bringing us gift cards for food. And it was a really, it was a really amazing thing to see kind of God's hand in that, that he was still caring for us, even though we were in the midst of another storm that was just, you know, it was horrendous. It was extremely, extremely difficult. So couple years after that goes on, I'm kind of struggling again. And I know now that it's, it's post-traumatic stress because I'm having some of those symptoms. Uh, I read a bunch of books about it. I would listened to a lot of podcasts about it. So I knew that that's what I was dealing with. And I had been told by several guys 
hey, you need to check out this program called Mighty Oaks. And they take veterans and they take them on a retreat and then deal with their PTSD. And I was like, I don't need that. I That's not for me. You know, it's for other guys that are really messed up. And I don't mean that. <laughs> I don't mean like they're messed up, but you understand that have actually been through right. something in my mind, like a traumatic incident during war. Like they saw their buddy get blown up next to him type of thing, which I didn't experience. But I kept getting told that. And finally, a friend of ours gave us a pamphlet from Mighty Oaks and said, you really need to go check this out. And I felt like God had been telling me this enough through friends that I I looked into it. So I ended up going and I actually flew out to a place called the wilds in Ohio and had a week there with the Mighty Oaks guys doing their program. And it was just amazing. It was incredibly helpful and freeing and I learned a ton, got to process through a lot of stuff with uh, the guys that I was there with in the cabin that I was staying in, but then also with the leadership that's there leading the thing. It was just really transformative and very helpful. So kind of that was the last, we'll say, big event up until now. That was three years ago. And just for the past three years, my wife and I have just been working on continuing to grow closer to the Lord and try to instill that in our kids and I guess we launched the podcast. That's probably the, that's probably another big life event for us. Cause that kind of changed the, the trajectory of, of my focus. But um, yeah, as far as personal life, that's where we're at. I've been working at the same fire station for the past eight years and I have a great crew of guys. My co-host on the podcast, Kevin is the other fireman on my shift. And then we have a great captain. His name's Hugo Valdivia and a rad engineer. His name's uh, Mike Kenobi. He's also been a guest on our podcast multiple times. So. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at. I hope that didn't take too long. No, that's awesome. I actually, just hearing your story, it's it's powerful and moving. And, you know, my heart breaks for you and what your family's gone through. At the same time, I kind of can look at, and I have a little bit of joy for you because I can see how you've been able to overcome and turn your pain into purpose, you know? And because I know, um, you know, my, I have family that's, that's been in the fire service. You know, my dad was a volunteer firefighter for a little while. And, uh, you know, and he was in, in the air force, but you know, he saw combat during Vietnam and, you know, I know a little bit about that PTSD and what that's like. And, uh, I know that a lot of guys in your position don't recover. Mm-hmm. They don't get out of it. Their life ends, you know, they don't have anything to call them out of that depth of despair and to see that is really encouraging in fact uh, just today uh uh i heard a story about a guy that shot himself in front Mm -hmm. of his five-year-old kid today you know i mean you know so the 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 men around us are hurting you know and i think i'm not saying that i don't believe that god caused your pain to you know to, to do something good. I think, you know, pain happens because the world is broken, you know, but you know, he's like, Hey man, I'm sorry that this has happened to you. Let's work something good out of it. You know? And now you're taking that and you're helping people. And that to me is a beautiful thing. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you. Um, and the thing I would say about post-traumatic stress specifically, cause I've lost, I've lost friends. Uh, to suicide that I served with in Ranger Battalion and to a man, they were guys I wasn't close with, but everybody I talked to that was, they all said, we didn't know anything was wrong. And that's one of the primary drivers behind our desire, Kevin and I's desire to start our podcast. As we saw in our world, in our department specifically, we had, we had, I think seven suicides in one year, just a couple of years ago, just within our fire department. And nationally, suicides among firemen and law enforcement guys are just, they've always been high, but it's really high right now. And one of the things that we've noticed as we have sat around the fire table with a lot of different guys in the kitchen, you sit around the table a lot talking, is that the things that get talked about are, you know, tactics on a fire, what you did at the river, should we throw this ladder on that building or that ladder, you just surface level stuff. And guys aren't really talking about the real life things, but if you're willing to speak about something, so for example, you go on a traumatic call that you had a hard time with, if you're willing to open up and talk about it at the table, 
and show that it's okay, the other guys around the table will, will jump in because they're having the same feelings and the same struggles. And you can have some really amazing conversations because we're all the same, right? We're all, we're all just men and we're flawed and we have, we have difficult stuff in our lives, but it's almost like when you're in a world, I say in a world of type A personalities in a firehouse, but really it's just men in general. We don't like to admit that we have a weakness or that we're, we have a problem, you know, we, because we're problem solvers, we are, we're fixers, we're tough and all that stuff is true. But I, I find that there's been huge value for me as I've worked through this in talking about it and sharing it and not all the time. I mean, obviously there's inappropriate times. I I don't talk to the guy at the supermarket about, (laughs) about a traumatic call. I was on that day, but with my buddies, with my friends, with my wife, you know, maybe with my pastor, or of course, you know, if I go see Max, who's my therapist, I'm going to talk to him about it, but being willing to have those conversations and talk it out. It's not the only thing, but it's immensely helpful. So that's kind of where the heart for starting our podcast started is just sharing those stories, sharing those places we were struggling and kind of making a forum, making it okay for other guys to feel like they could do the same. Because like you said, it's happening and all too often it happens quietly. We don't know, you know, we weren't aware. And I know I know to a man that you hear something like that and it, it doesn't matter if you were just an acquaintance of that guy or a close friend, if you knew something was going on, you would do whatever it took, right? You would fly across the country to go sit with him, you know, anything. But if you don't know, what can you do? Exactly. So let's say that there's some guys that are listening and they're, you know, whether it's PTSD from growing up in an abusive home, or maybe they served and they had experiences, or maybe they were in, in, you know, like you, maybe they're a first responder and they experienced things or, or had similar experiences, you know, with their kids or, or so where do you start? Where do you start to work through that? Yes. Before I answer that, you said the perfect thing that I missed and was going to highlight. You don't have to be a combat veteran. You don't have to be a first responder. You don't have to be a law enforcement officer there's PTSD or, you know, it doesn't matter how you want to term it. Cause some people don't like that term, but everybody's dealing with stress. And if you came from a broken home or you lost your mom recently or your grandmother that raised you, you know, there's all kinds of things that can do that. And the thing about stress is if we're not dealing with it, it continues to build on itself. It's like, it's like a bucket of water. And if you'd never handle the bucket of water, eventually it's going to overflow. So the thing that really becomes a problem and and quote unquote sets you off might seem like a small thing, but it really isn't that it's everything that went before that. So don't think all that to say, don't think that just because you're not a combat veteran that saw horrible things in a war that you can't have post-traumatic stress, it can be anywhere. So that having been said, I would personally say where you start is with your local church. Um, If you don't have a faith and that's not, where you're at, I would say it's time to start, but, (laughs) right. But if not, well, let's go down the church road first. If you're not involved in a church and don't have a small group, don't have a group of friends there, aren't connected that, that is probably, I think the best resource. And if you're in a church right now that you feel like is too big and you're just kind of anonymous there and the pastor might be giving great sermons, but you're not really plugged in either find a small group within that church or go find a different church. Find a group of people that you can hang out with on a regular basis that you can talk to that can be there to support you because really your community that you build around you is going to be, they're going to be your first responders. If you're not a person of faith, it gets a little tougher, but it's not impossible. And what you need to do is tap into those friends that you do have now. So guys that you work with, people that you go mountain biking with, you know, whatever it is, that thing you do, just start being a little bit more intentional about having conversations that are more meaningful and try to talk about that stuff. Go find yourself a good therapist. If you start talking to people that are in your circle, you're going to find that somebody sought counseling at some point and has somebody to recommend. And I would say that's the best way to do it because you do want to find somebody that's a good fit. Um, so you can go down that road. If you are military or a first responder, Mighty Oaks, the program I went to, is an amazing resource. I can't say enough about those guys. Their their ministry is just incredible. It doesn't cost you a dime. Uh, it's a week long program, 
and you basically just go find their website and sign up and they'll they'll plug you into a class. They have campuses all over the place. So they have one in California, Ohio, Texas, uh, Virginia. But that's a good week-long program that gives you a good starting point. It's not the end-all be-all because after that, guess what they tell you to go do? Get plugged into your local church and start doing those other things. But number one thing is don't try to go it alone. You got to get support around you because when you're in that place, especially if it's especially if it's really progressed to a point where you're starting to really deal with depression and the symptoms that come with PTSD, which is, you know, struggles with sleeping, flashbacks, hypervigilance, um, sensitivity to, to noise, things like that. You don't want to go it alone. You really want a support system there because you can easily just self-isolate, but that's just going to compound the problems and make them worse. Yeah. I, I think just in general, I think it's good to make sure you have that support system around you. Absolutely. Even if you're not at that place where yes. it's that bad, you know, I know like, like, I don't know that I have PTSD, but I know that I have some trauma. I know that I have some stress and I've been working through some things of my own recently here this past year, just dude, 2020, I think like, I always say that like life is like a sponge mm. and whatever's on the inside will come out when pressure is applied. Mm. So 2020 was like squeezing that sponge dry and mm-hmm. all the nasty water comes out. Yeah. And if, if you don't make sure that sponge is then filling back up with good, clean water, mm. then you have to do it all over again. And so, you know, 2020 for me, man, that was a rough year because there was so much pressure constantly. And, and I look back and I'm like, man, if I would have just, you know, and especially when you're in a position like we are, right, where people are counting on us to be that source of yeah. inspiration or encouragement. Guess what? That's okay. We screw up too, and we get it wrong sometimes, and we yes, got to go do. back and start over. You know, yeah. that's that's what I'm working through sometimes. You know, yeah, for sure. My my buddy Max, I keep talking about him. Uh, he actually had a really great analogy about the last the last year, the whole COVID thing. He said, because we asked him how, what he was seeing with people that he was talking to, how it was affecting people. And he said that what he feels like is that we've gone through a national period of like loss and mourning, almost like we all lost a loved one because our lives changed so dramatically. And we all lost things that we would just normally do and take for granted. And it's different for everybody, but everybody lost something, right? That you used to do that now you couldn't do or was just too hard to do. So you stopped doing it. And it was not just one or two people. It was literally everybody. And so he said, there's this weird, like collective mourning that happened where we all just felt this huge sense of loss and uncertainty because we didn't know if it was ever going to come back. Right. So we definitely, yeah. I definitely identify with that. We went through that too. And, you know, and I think that if there is junk from the past or if there's stuff that you haven't sorted out that just gets amplified by your current situations too, you know? So like you talked about, um, you know, when your first son died, you didn't really deal with it, Mm -hmm. you know? So then it, it's almost like when you, I mean, I don't know. And I'm not saying that your second son died because of this, but it's like, if you don't deal with this, something, then something happens to bring it back again, you know? And if you don't deal with that, then something else happens to bring it get back again. Like when you were on a fire call and there it is again, you know, it, it's, I, and I, you know, you, you talk to a guy who gets divorced and then he has the trauma and the, the stress and the hurt of that. And then he just goes and then he gets another lady and then it's the same thing. Mm. It just keeps these cycles going because we've got crap to deal with, you know? Yeah. That's fascinating. I, uh, I have thought down that line before specifically in, the death of the sons. I I have literally thought that before. Like, well, did this happen because we didn't learn the lesson that we were supposed to learn the first time? And I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I can understand the mind of God. And I'm thankful that I can't because if I could, then I probably wouldn't follow him because then what would be the point? But right, right, right. I, I, I know that he's bigger than me and I'm so thankful for that. And I, I can't understand But there is, I do believe there is some truth behind that, that there are lessons that we have to learn in order to progress and become the people that he's designed us to be, to accomplish whatever that is that he has for us in the future. And yeah, if we don't make those changes, 
and we keep banging our heads against the same wall, he will continue to send us those lessons because he's trying to grow us into who he designed us to be. Yeah. And like I said, I, I don't mean to imply that. No, no, no. That, I know that, you know, that it was God causing it. Cause I, and I, I, I want to clarify that too. Cause I know sometimes people will get that in their mind and I'm like, no, God brings good things, you know? God brings good things. And when the bad things happen, he brings good things out of the bad things. I think for the most part, you know, God gives gifts to his children, good gifts. You know, I, I know that there's an encouragement in that, in that knowing, you know, he's there. So here you are now, you are, uh, you're serving in the fire department. How often, what was your schedule look like with that? Like, are you, I know my, I think uh, my uncle does like so many days on and then he's off for so many days. Or do you work like a regular shift or how does that work for you, man? Yeah. LA County fire. I'm going to throw them under the bus right now, which I don't normally do. They have the worst possible schedule of every fire department anywhere. (laughs) We, uh, no, it's not that bad. We work 24 hour shifts and right now I'm going to say it and it's not going to make any sense, but we do a shift on a shift off, a shift on two off shift on a shift off a shift on four off. So basically every month, we have a couple of two-day week it, you know, weekends. We have a couple of two days off in a row and a couple of four days off in a row. And then a lot of in-between days in there. So your regular scheduled 24-hour shifts, you would do 10 or 11 a month, depending on the month. And what that really turns into, because our department is so large, we end up working about, it's on average 12 to 15 a month with overtimes because we have a lot of vacancies and we can't leave them vacant. They have to be filled. So you'll either volunteer and go work one of those, or you won't volunteer and they'll tell you, Hey, you're working that one because <laughs> somebody, somebody has to be there. So there's a whole system in place, but that's basically it. We are trying right now. We've been trying for actually years to get to a schedule where we work 48 hours in a row and then do 96 hours off. Mm. So we're pushing for that. It's got a lot of stuff behind it. One of the primary things is sleep deprivation is that if you have a four day period after your two day, you have more time to recover from the loss of sleep during the previous two days. We talk about the, you know, where I'm out here on the East coast, well, not the coast, but on the East side of the country. And we yeah. hear about all these fires that you guys have. Is yeah. that something that you guys find yourself with a lot of that going on or? So LA County fights a lot of brush fires and that's what makes the news. I work on a truck. So a ladder truck with a big ladder on the back in the city of Whittier. So we have no brush anywhere near us. And because we are the ladder truck for the area. So not just our, our station's responsibility, actually we serve the surrounding stations too with that ladder truck. So we actually can't leave. So if I'm on regular duty at my station and a giant brush fire breaks out, which does happen frequently here, we won't go. We have to stay where Mm -hmm. we're at because if there's a structure fire, they need our ladders. They need our chainsaws. They need our expertise. Or if there's a TC with people trapped inside, that's what we do. We have all those tools. So the only way I will personally end up on a brush fire is if I'm working at another station on an overtime, which does happen. Mm -hmm. But for me personally, it's less frequent. But we do have giant wildfires. Los Angeles County is massive. And there's a lot of interface between where people live and then the brush. So the the wildlands. And it happens. It happens every summer. It happens into the fall. And with the population exploding down here in Southern California, like it has been, there's more and more of that interface where people are living and working right next to the wildland. And so there's more potential for fires to start. And then as a state, because of various reasons, we also have done a poor job of managing those lands. So there are ways that you can mitigate how hot the fire will burn. You can't stop it from starting, but if you keep the, the undergrowth and the brush trimmed and, you know, taken care of, they won't spread as fast, but we, we have had trouble as a state doing that. And so because of that, you see the giant fires that burn, burn homes and unfortunately take lives sometimes. Yeah. So that is a very real thing for me personally, what that means when that goes on and we have a giant wildfire, we send the world to it. So we send tons of rigs and tons of guys. And then those of us that didn't get sent now, we just end up working nonstop to fill those spots because we still have to have the stations fully operational and the rigs fully staffed. So when they're working out on the wildland fire, me and my buddy, Kevin, will still be working. We're just in the cities filling the, filling the vacancies. Gotcha. Well, that's, 
just as important. So that's awesome. I appreciate it. Guys, I, I kind of want to know sometimes how that all comes together, you know? It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's a giant, it's a giant machine. And because we're, we're close to Orange County fire and LA city and Ventura, we obviously do a lot of mutual aid with those departments because we have big fires that cross borders. And so there's the logistics of all that stuff is, you know, that's way above my pay grade, but some of the things that it's like mobilizing an army really at times, right. I mean, there'd be thousands and thousands of firemen on a fire and there are, there are guys with well, a lot smarter than me that are running those and putting people where they need to be and doing the communication. So yeah, it can be a pretty big deal. That's awesome. No, I really have appreciated your insight and your story. Um, I kind of want to ask a couple of questions as we kind of start winding down our interview here that are kind of personal. And uh, one of them, you know, I, I mean, you've, you've been very personal as you've been sharing. So imagine that uh, young Noel, who uh, I guess maybe straight off the camp, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> straight off, straight off the camp, uh, walks in the room and you have the opportunity to talk to him right now. What are you going to tell him? I actually, I've thought about this because I heard somebody else get asked it probably on your show, probably on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the main thing I would tell him is you're not ever going to be alone. And I have to explain that. So I grew up a Christian, as I mentioned, and I had a lot of God's word taught to me. I had good examples lived out by both my parents and just a lot of people that I was around growing up, but there were certain things that I just didn't learn. And I think I didn't learn them because I'm more of a, I have to learn by going through something. I can't learn as easily by just being told something can't really internalize it, make it my own. So one of the things that I learned at Mighty Oaks that I didn't, that I hadn't really realized in process is that when we lost Asher specifically, I felt like I was alone in that moment. And I had pictured myself and my wife just kind of alone there in the apartment doing CPR, trying to save him and being unable to do so. And while I was at mighty Oaks, uh, a good, now a good friend of mine actually told me that he saw me in that moment. He described it to me, which was, at the time bizarre because I hadn't explained to him what had really happened, just that we had lost the son. And he said, I saw, I saw you and your wife kneeling on this floor with your son. And I saw that Jesus was there kneeling with you too. And he's like, I don't know what that means to you, but I, I just, I saw that while we were praying together and it just shattered me because I had looked at that moment my whole life. Like I was alone in that tragedy and God had kind of left, right. Had left the scene. And I had decided after that, that, well, you know, I'm still going to believe in this God. I'm still going to have faith, but I was just trying to do it on my own strength and I was struggling with it. So just that idea that I can't explain to you why those things happened, right? They're horrible. And I do believe that God loves us, me, my family, my wife. So I don't think that he would choose to put us through that. I believe it's part of the fact that we have a broken fallen world, but I don't know how the mechanics of all that works. But I, I do know and I do believe that in that moment, God was right there with me. He was there with me, shedding tears with me like he cried when Lazarus died, even though he knew he was going to go raise him from the dead, still experiencing that human emotion that he knows because he walked on this earth. So that's probably, it's a little complicated, but that's probably the one thing I would say to him is that you're not alone. You're never alone. That's awesome. All right. Then the next question that I love to kind of wrap things up with too is, what is the most important advice that you've got for the men that are listening today? I got two. I'm going to cheat and do two. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go hundred percent and say, I've lived, I've lived my life with a relationship with God where I'm leaning into that and looking to him for strength. And I've done the opposite where I'm ignoring that and trying to live off my own strength and I can tell you which one works from experience. And I, I've seen it not just in my life, but I've seen it in other men's lives. A relationship with God and really leaning into that is, it's going to be beneficial at every turn. And there's going to come a point in your life, unfortunately, because we all go through tragedy where you, where you really need that. And if you have that built into you already and established, 
then it's not going to make that situation easy. It's not going to make the pain go away, but it's going to be a lot better of an experience. You're going to learn a lot more from it. You're going to get out of it in much better shape than if you're trying to rebuild that during the process, which is something that I've personally experienced. So for me personally, a relationship with God is the thing and it's something that constantly needs work and it's a daily, it's a daily process. And I can't say enough about how important I think that is for, for everybody. And so for those of you, if you're not believers, because I know you've probably got people there. We do. Sure. They're everywhere. And I love it that they're out there. Um, moderation. I hear this term all the time in the fire station. They say moderation in everything. I'm going to encourage you that you might be like me. Moderation doesn't work for me. So if I look at alcohol, for example, I don't think there's any problem with having a glass of wine or two glasses of wine with dinner, a beer every once in a while. I really don't think there's a problem with that. But I know that for me, I can't do that. I don't do moderation. If I, I try not to eat a lot of sugar because I have some inflammation issues and it, it doesn't sit well with me, but I love sugar. And so like last, just last night, full disclosure, um, I came home with my family from having dinner out and I looked in the freezer and there's a pint of ice cream in there. So I started eating it because I love ice cream. And I, ate, I literally ate, I mean, it was, you know, one of those little guys, but I ate the whole thing. Like, do I need to do that? Is that a good idea? Should I have just had a few bites or half of it? Maybe. Yeah. But I, I just don't, I go overboard. So I think it's okay for you to have areas in your life that you just don't do, that you just abstain from. And it's not for everybody. I fully celebrate and support guys that can have a little bit of something, enjoy it and then move on. But recognize if you're not that kind of guy and just stay away from it. You'll learn that you don't really need it and you'll be better for it. I think that's excellent advice. It may excellent be just for advice. me. I might be the only guy. But. No, you're right on. <laughs> no, it's the same with me, man. I get it 100%. That's awesome. So if people want to follow the work that you're doing, what's the best place for them to connect with you, man? What is it? So... Instagram, we are the fire you carry, not we. If you look up the fire you carry on Instagram, you'll find us there. We post every episode on there so you can find you can find us through there. We have a website that has all of our episodes on it and there's a little bit of an about me page. We're still kind of building that, but you can find us there and that is thefireyoucarry.com. And then if you're on any of the major podcasting platforms and you just type in the fire you carry, we will come up, not carry the fire. Cause there is another podcast out there called carry the fire. We are the fire you carry, but you'll see it. We got a little skull logo and awesome. there's an ax on it. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much it for us. Awesome. Anything else you want to share today, buddy? No, I think that's good, man. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been a good, a good chance to chat. I know we've been back and forth a lot and uh, I love what you're doing out there. It's rad. It looks like you pour a lot of time and effort into your community. And from a standpoint of somebody who's kind of just launching and starting to build that, I really appreciate all the work that goes into that. I know it's a lot, but I, I know there's value in that for your guys. And so I would say, keep doing what you're doing, man. Keep fighting the good fight because it's valuable. And I don't know, but I do know that you're touching lives and having an impact. So I would just say, keep it up. And thank you so much for considering me to be on your show. Well, I appreciate everything that you shared today, man. It's some good stuff for us all to think about. And I want to encourage our listeners to make sure they follow what you're doing, especially if, if the stuff that you're saying resonates, you know, if what Noel's saying today resonates, please hop on, check out his podcast, connect with him. And I'm sure that he wouldn't mind at all if you reached out to him directly as well and just say, Hey, no, man. I don't. In fact, we have, uh, if you go, if you go listen to any of the recent episodes and check out the show notes, we actually have a discord group where you can jump in the discord server. It's a chat room essentially, but I'm in there. So if, if you've gone through any of that stuff and you want to talk or anything like that, yeah, please reach out to me. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. But if you can find me anywhere, yeah, hit me up. I'll talk to you awesome. for sure. Thanks. Awesome. Brother. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Good talking to you. Not going to lie. This was a very painful conversation to listen to, to hear the things that Noel has had to go through, to know that there are a lot of men who have gone through similar experiences 
and maybe not the same experiences, but the truth is, in one way or another, we've all had traumas, guys. We've all had some kind of trauma and some kind of experience that has hurt. And we're living in a world where people will use it as an excuse to not grow and to not get better and to just blame all of their problems on it or to just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. That's not manly. A man faces his problems, gets the help he needs, and then rises above and works through it. That's what we're asking you to do. We're also here to help you. I'm going to tell you, I'm not an expert at trauma therapy. I'm not an expert at post-traumatic stress disorder or counseling or psychology or any of those things. But I'm a friend and I'll listen. And I know that in the Manlyhood Man Cave, we've got a bunch of friends who will listen. And maybe, if nothing else, we can point you in the right direction of somebody who can help you. If you're up for that, please join the man cave. Tell us what you're going through. Let us be there for you. Shoot me a message if you don't want to talk about it publicly. And if I can find help for you or if I can refer you to somebody, I'll do that. All right? Anyway, guys, I love you. I care about you. And I'll see you next time. If you want to be a better man, check out our website, manlyhood.com, for blogs, videos, and more from our Manlyhood team. Men, you can also join our private Facebook group, Manlyhood Man Cave, where you can meet up with a band of brothers who will challenge you and help you on your journey of manhood. This episode is produced by Hatcher Media for Manlyhood.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to the show. Tune in again for more of the Manlyhood Mancast.